come now to the final section of the Old Testament, the minor prophets. Now, don't let that term throw you. Uh, they're not minor because they're unimportant, simply because they're little books, shorter books in most cases, just a couple of chapters each. Twelve different prophets of God who come on the scene at twelve different times with a message from the Lord, thus saith the Lord. Some were prophets to the northern kingdom of Israel, some to the southern kingdom of Judah. Some had a message for their time, some had a message for all time. The minor prophets begin with the book of Hosea. The collection of the twelve books is often called or referred to as the twelve. Uh, the twelve that are collected together. Uh, but uh, they were written separately at separate times. The twenty-seven chapters that are written to the northern kingdom of Israel include the books of Jonah, Amos, and Hosea. You'll notice that Jonah is one of the oldest of the minor prophets, writing back in the 8th century, in the 700s. Jonah, the prophet that said, I don't want to go to Nineveh in Iraq to preach. I'm going to go on a cruise instead on the Mediterranean, and ended up changing his mind. Amos, a shepherd, a farmer, a herdsman, a kind of rough, crude guy that came from the south and went to the north and told him, you better repent or you're really in trouble. And Hosea, a contemporary of Isaiah, who ends up marrying an unfaithful wife, who is an illustration of the unfaithfulness of Israel, who is supposed to be married to the Lord Himself. And then to the southern kingdom, there are 20 chapters in the Minor Prophets. Obadiah, the oldest of all, back in the 800s, uh, who predicts the fall of Edom. Uh, Joel, who says, beware, the day of the Lord is coming. Micah, a contemporary of Isaiah, who says that the Messiah is going to be born in Bethlehem. Nahum, who predicts the fall of Nineveh, of the Assyrian Empire. Uh, Zephaniah, who calls the people of God to repent, to revival. And Habakkuk, who predicts the fall of Babylon. Each one of these prophets of God to Judah in the south had a unique and distinctive message that needed to be heard. And then there are three minor prophets that come after the Babylonian captivity, the post-exilic period, after the Babylonian exile, Haggai, who in 520 tells the exiles who have returned, finish the temple. You got it started, now finish the job. Rebuild the second temple. Zechariah, who predicts the coming of the Messiah. He's coming on a donkey. Uh, he's coming with palm branches. He's coming to reign and rule as king. Prepare yourself for the arrival of the king. And then the last prophet of the Bible, Malachi. Notice the dates in the 400s. Malachi gives one last final warning to the people of God. Prepare your hearts for the coming of the Lord, lest He come and strike the land with the curse of the law. Twelve minor prophets, equally divided between the northern kingdom, the southern kingdom, and the post-exilic community that returns after the Babylonian captivity. Let's take a quick look at each of the twelve. First of all, Hosea. His name means salvation. He's writing in about 755 to 720 B.C., the days roughly of Isaiah, to the nation of Israel, the northern kingdom, however, illustrating God's love for Israel with the theme of undying love. Take your Bible and look at Hosea 1.1. The word of the Lord came unto Hosea, the son of Buri, in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, same kings Isaiah served under in Judah, and Jeroboam, the king of Israel in the north. Hosea is preaching to the northern kingdom. At the same time, Isaiah is preaching to the southern kingdom. And at the beginning, the word of the Lord came to Hosea, and the Lord said to Hosea, Go take a wife of whoredoms, a prostitute, and children of a prostitute. For the land has committed prostitution in departing from the Lord. And he took a woman by the name of Gomer, and she bore him a son. And the Lord said, Call his name Jezreel, because I will avenge the blood of Jezreel upon the house of Jehu, who slaughtered all of the kings in order to come to power. And ultimately, I'm going to bring the judgment of God on the nation of Israel, the northern kingdom, and the valley of 
Jezreel, later known as Armageddon. Uh, Hosea, your own life and experience will be an illustration of God's dealings with Israel, the northern kingdom. Now, there are all kinds of questions that are proposed uh, by various scholars. Why would God tell him to marry a prostitute? Was she already a prostitute, or did he feel like God led me to marry this woman, and wow, look how she turned out. Look at the problems I faced. Uh, He ends up having to go into the slave market and buys her back for 15 pieces of silver, the price of a slave in those days. Uh, he, he purchases his own wife from the slave market. She has made such a mess out of her life. She's had several children, not by him, by somebody else. Uh, her name is Gomer. Uh, the son, Jezreel's name means visitation. The daughter, Lo Ruhama, no mercy. And the son, Lo Ami, not my people, not my kid. Uh, Ami was the name the Jews loved to apply to themselves. We are the Ami of God, the people of God. But lo, Ami, not my people, the Goyim, the Gentiles, or whatever. And God uses the tragedies in Hosea's own life and ministry to illustrate to the people of Israel that He really loves them. Uh, that they're the ones that are making the mistake. They're the ones that are running away from Him. They're the ones that are fleeing from Him. They're the ones that have turned their back on Him. They have been unfaithful. They're chasing after the other gods uh, of the pagan nations uh, and violating their covenant marriage relationship to God. You know, the Bible speaks to us of the fact that we are married to Christ in the New Testament, that He has been betrothed to us and us to Him, uh, that we have the seal, the signet ring, the uh, down payment, the deposit of the Holy Spirit, uh, that He will make good on the commitment of marriage that one day will be taken in the rapture to the marriage of the Lamb. When we see the Lord face to face uh, and He takes us home to the Father's house and His banner over us is love. But all too often we're unfaithful just like Hosea's wife and God has to reach out to us time after time to call us to repent and bring us back to Himself. And sometimes we even come to the end of the rope and we're at the bottom of the barrel just like Gomer was. Uh, Enslaved by sin and our habits and our addictions and our problems and our difficulties and our wrong choices and God reminds us that even then He still loves us. Go get her, He said, and bring her back. There's also the reminder in this story that just because you're in the ministry doesn't mean that you have an insurance policy against tragedies and problems and difficulties. Now, sometimes the worst of things happen to the best of people, but God reminds us that He has not abandoned us in those times, that He is still working out His plans and His purposes in our lives. He is still reaching out to us to call us back to Himself and to bring us to Himself. He still loves us and He still has a plan and a purpose for our lives. What we see in the book of Hosea is that her problems illustrate God's love for the nation of Israel and the national promise is given uh, that uh, God will forgive the sins of Israel. He will judge the sins of Israel but He will also restore Israel and He will bring her back to a position of prominence eventually. The promise is given in chapter 3, verse 4. For the children of Israel will abide many days without a king, without a prince, and without a sacrifice, without an image, without an effort, uh, without uh, teraphim. But afterward the children of Israel shall return and they will seek the Lord their God and David their king, and shall fear the Lord and His goodness in the latter days. Oh, long after Isaiah gave the prophecy, uh, the nation of Israel in the north would be under the judgment of God, scattered by the Assyrians. It would be centuries before they would return to the land. And then he looks down through the quarter of time to the last days and says there will be many years that they'll be without a priesthood, they'll be without a temple, they'll be without a king, but God has not abandoned them. Paul raises that question in the New Testament. Uh, Has God abandoned His people Israel? No, God forbid. Eventually, all Israel shall be saved. But in the meantime, many are blinded until the time of the end. And the promise in the book of Hosea is God will eventually bring His children back to Himself and God will keep that promise that is given to us in chapter 3, verses 4 and 5. 
the book of Hosea, a wonderful reminder that even in the worst of times, God is at work. God has not forgotten us. God has not abandoned us. The second of the minor prophets is the book of Joel. Yoel, that talks about the fact that God is the one that we worship. God is the one that we serve. Joel, a prophet of Judah, the southern kingdom, writing in the 800s B.C., a warning of future judgment. And his theme is, beware, prepare, the coming of the day of the Lord is at hand. A terrible day, a dark day, a dreadful day. The day of the Lord is Armageddon. The day of the Lord is the final judgment when the armies are gathered together, when the nation is under attack. Uh, take your Bible. Look at Joel chapter 1, verse 1. The word of the Lord came to Joel, uh, the son of Pethuel. He said, Hear this, you old men. Give ear, you inhabitants of the land. Uh, has this been in your days or even in the days of your father? Tell it to your children. Let your children tell it to their children. Generation after generation, beware. The locusts are coming. The judgment is coming. Lament like a virgin. Lament like a widow. Armies are coming. They're marching into your city. Why? Uh, call the solemn fast in verse 14. Call the solemn assembly. Alas, verse 15, for the day of the Lord is at hand. Uh, the day of destruction from the Almighty. A day when the food is cut off. When the seed is rotten. Uh, when the land does not produce. Uh, blow the trumpet in Zion. Lift up the trumpet. Blow the shofar. Sound the alarm in my holy mountain. Chapter 2 verse 1. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. Why? The day of the Lord is coming. Underline the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is always in the Old Testament prophets the day of judgment and wrath that is coming. Uh, in Joel's prophecy he sees a present judgment that is imminent in his own lifetime. And then he sees a future judgment that is ultimate. Uh, that the invasion of a northern army is coming into the valley of Jehoshaphat. Trouble is on the horizon. Blow the trumpet. The fire devours. The noise of chariots can be heard. And then he gives the appeal in chapter 2, verse 12. Therefore he says, Turn even unto me, the Lord says, with all your heart, with fasting and with weeping and with mourning. Rend your heart and not your garments and return to the Lord your God. Return and repent and He will leave a blessing for you. Don't just go through the ritual and the routine of religion and rip your clothes because that's what people do in the Middle East, uh, in the ancient world. Rip your heart. Genuinely repent and turn to the Lord and call on the Lord while there is time. Is there a place for crying out to God, calling out to God with all of your heart, with all of your soul? Is there a place and a time for tears of repentance? Yes, Joel says. That is the only thing that will stave off the judgment of God. But then he goes on to say that there's something worse coming in the future. There is an army moving on the horizon. There, there is a time coming when judgment will come, but there's also another appeal from God. There's another promise from God. Chapter 2, verse 28, The time shall come to pass that I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will see dreams. Uh, your young men will see visions. The, the servants and the hand maids. I'll pour out my spirit on them. I'll show wonders in the heaven uh, and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. Uh, the sun will be turned into darkness, the moon to blood, for the great and terrible day of the Lord shall come, but whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Wow, what a bunch of verses you have there. The promise of Pentecost, the pouring out of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost is like the statement here in Joel 2.28 uh, that I'll pour out my Spirit on your sons and daughters. Peter quotes this uh, in his sermon on the day of Pentecost that this is fulfilled today, that the Spirit of God is poured out on us in announcing the gospel of Jesus Christ, of calling people to faith in Him. But like so many of the prophecies, part of it is fulfilled at that that point, but part of it later. Just as you have Jesus reading uh, Isaiah 61 uh, in, in the synagogue at Nazareth saying, uh, this is the good and acceptable year of the Lord, and he stops. But he doesn't say, and declare the day of the vengeance of our God, because he said, this other part's fulfilled today in your hearing, but the latter part is not. So it is here that the coming of the Spirit is the fulfillment at Pentecost. But then he says there's coming a dreadful, terrible day of the Lord as well. There's coming a day of judgment uh, when the sun and the moon will be darkened, as is described in the book of Revelation. On, on the one hand, the promise of the coming of God at Pentecost. On the other hand, 
the coming of Christ at Armageddon. You see, the balance of the prophecies always gives us warning on the one hand, hope on the other hand. There is a battle coming. The nations are gathered, chapter 3, verse 2, in the valley of Jehoshaphat. Uh, Therefore, he says, you better go and proclaim among the Gentiles, prepare war, wake up the mighty men, let all the men of war draw near, beat your plowshares into swords, the opposite of what Isaiah said. Your pruning hooks into spears, let the weak say, I am strong. Gather in the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there I will sit to judge the nation, multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. He reminds us that God is still the God over all the earth, over all the nations. And though the Gentiles may come in the battle of Armageddon to attack Israel, God will sit in judgment in the valley of Jehoshaphat, and God will judge the nations. The scripture tells us in the New Testament, He separates the sheep from the goats, the nations that have blessed and loved His children from those that have attacked them, His brothers after the flesh. And then He tells us, A fountain shall spring forth from the house of the Lord, and the blessing of God will pour forth on those who put their trust in Him. Joel, the prophet who gives the warning of the coming of the day of the Lord. And then we go to the third prophet, Amos the herdsman from Tekoa, the shepherd from Tekoa. Notice again, chapter 1, verse 1, the words of Amos, who was among the herdsmen or the shepherds of Tekoa, what he saw concerning Israel, the northern kingdom, in the days of Uzziah, the king of Judah, in the days of Jeroboam, the king of Israel, two years before the great earthquake. And he said, The Lord will roar from Zion, His voice from Jerusalem. The inhabitants and the habitations of the shepherds will mourn, and the top of Mount Carmel will wither, and God will come and judge the nations. And he names them Damascus, uh, and Ashkelon, and Tyre, uh, and the Philistines, and the Edomites, and the Ammonites, and the Moabites. And then God will send fire even on Judah and deal with His people. And then he raises the question, Can two walk together unless they are agreed? No wonder there is a division in this nation. No wonder the northern kingdom has rebelled and left. Uh, Come to Bethel, he says, to the place of transgression, that ancient place where Jacob came and came to the house of God and had such a great experience with God, and the northern kingdom has now turned it into a house of idolatry. Uh, Ten miles north of Jerusalem, you've set up your own rival worship center. You have set up the gods of the pagans, so God will withhold rain from you. Uh, the, The fulfillment of the prayer ultimately of a Elijah the prophet, uh, God will smite you with judgment and pestilence. Why? You must prepare to meet your God, Amos 4.12, because God is coming to hold you accountable for your sin, Israel. Don't think you can get away with it. And this shepherd from the southern kingdom boldly marches up to Bethel. He confronts the false prophets of the northern kingdom, pronounces the judgment of God, and escapes with his life. God sometimes has to toughen the preacher to tell people what they do not want to hear. So many people today say, well, just tell me what I want to hear. Just prophesy smooth, easy things to us. But sometimes the prophet of God has to say, thus saith the Lord, straighten up or die. Turn or fry. Uh, Unless you repent, judgment is coming. And surely the judgment of God was coming. Oh, it would take time. Amos is giving the message in about 755 B.C. uh, The judgment fell on the northern kingdom in 722. The Assyrians marched in from Nineveh and wiped out the northern kingdom, toppled the city of Samaria, wrecked the sanctuary at Bethel, took the kingdom and took the people into captivity and scattered them throughout the Middle East. It is a warning in the book of Amos of the judgment of God on the nations around as well as the nation of Israel herself. Then we come to the book of Obadiah, one of the shortest books in all the Old Testament. It's so short it's only a chapter, so it just has a series of verses in it. Obadiah says, this is the vision of Obadiah. Thus saith the Lord God concerning Edom. Circle Edom's name in the first verse. The prophecy is about the Edomites. The pride of your heart, verse 3, has deceived you. 
you that dwell in the clefts of the rock, whose habitation is so high, who says in your heart, who will bring me down to the ground? Uh, where are this powerful kingdom founded by Esau? The Edomites here in the red rocks uh, of southern Jordan. We have our own kingdom, a mountain kingdom, a mountain fortress that cannot be conquered. Uh, the great city of Petra is here, uh, and we will not listen to anybody. We're going to do our own thing. Obadiah comes along, a prophet of Judah, in the 800s, the 9th century B.C., preaching to the southern kingdom, warning Edom, comforting Judah, and warning of the coming doom of Edom that Edom will fall. Uh, the, the prophecy is blunt and right to the point. The day of the Lord is near upon all the heathen, in verse 15. Uh, that which has been done shall be done unto you. Uh, and your reward shall return upon your head, but Mount Zion, verse 17, shall be delivered. The holiness of the house of Jacob shall be its possession, and the house of Jacob shall be like a fire, and the house of Joseph like a flame, and the house of Esau like stubble. Mount Esau shall fall. Now, the Edomites lived and survived in that kingdom for centuries. Ultimately, it was taken over by a group of people called Nabataeans. Herod the Great himself was an Edomite, an Edomian, from uh, uh, the ancient Nabataean kingdom. They carved a beautiful red rock city right out of the mountains at uh, Petra, and they thought that city will stand forever. Nobody's ever going to take this place down. Uh, they can't get through the narrow pass to attack us. Uh, we're, we're secure here. But all God had to do is move on the hearts of the people, and the caravans changed the trade route, and it no longer came through the narrow pass. It no longer came by Petra. It went elsewhere, and when the money dried up, the people left and vacated the ancient city. And Petra sits there today empty, absolutely vacant, because the prophecy of Obadiah came true just as he said it would. Then we come to the little book of Jonah. I, everybody knows the story of Jonah. And the whale, although he's not called a whale here, he's called a fish, the great fish, one of the many things that God prepared. Now, sometimes uh, one of our problems when we study the Bible is we overlook the obvious. We come to something we think we know, and we go right past it and miss the whole point of it. Why did Jonah flee? Because he was afraid? Or because he was prejudiced? Uh, because he didn't want to go to Nineveh? Or because he didn't want him to repent? Uh, because he didn't think they would repent? or he was afraid God would forgive him if they did repent. Uh, Jonah's name, interestingly, means dove, uh, the bird of peace that takes its flight. He writes in the 700s B.C., in the 8th century, writing to the northern kingdom of Israel. The theme in the book is talking about the universality of salvation, the idea that salvation is available to anybody in the universe that will come to God and repent. Uh, that God is not only willing to save the Israelites or the Jews of Judah, God is willing to save the Assyrians of Nineveh as well. Uh, but Jonah struggles with all of this. He doesn't want Assyria to be spared. Uh, the setting of the book is in the days when Nineveh, the capital of Assyria, was the most powerful kingdom in the ancient world. When a man by the name of Shalmaneser IV ruled Assyria, northern Iraq, roughly equivalent to the area where the Kurds are today near the modern city of Mosul on the Tigris River. There Nineveh sat as the great capital of the ancient world and during the reign of Jeroboam II of Israel in a time of prosperity. In fact, it was the last era of northern prosperity 50 years before the Assyrian captivity. You see, the Assyrians were their enemies. They were notorious in the Middle East for their cruelty. They loved to capture you alive and peel off your skin and tie you to a stake and let the animals eat the remains. Uh, the, the Assyrians were feared in the ancient world. Uh, and Jonah's attitude is, let them come under the judgment of God. Why should they repent? Why should I care? They're the enemy. And indeed in time they would be, but the book of Jonah reminds us that God is concerned about all people and he reaches out in compassion even to the enemy. If we look at a map 
of the Middle East in that period of time, the Assyrian Empire stretched all the way out of the Tigris-Euphrates Valley of Iraq, far to the north to the edge of southern Russia, into part of what today would be Turkey. It overran Syria uh, and part of the Middle East all the way down even to the edges of, of Egypt. And yet the Bible tells us in the book of Isaiah they were never able to capture Jerusalem and the kingdom of Judah never fell to them. And the archaeology of Israel verifies that because the Assyrians were great colonizers. Everywhere they went they tried to build Assyrian style houses. Houses, bring in Assyrian culture, uh, bring in Assyrian pottery, etc., uh, and bring in Assyrians to live in all these places and Assyrianize those places. The archaeologists found that in northern Israel, which the Bible says fell to the Assyrians, sure enough, the remains of Assyrian style houses, the remains of Assyrian style pottery, but none in Judah. They never got a foothold in Judah. They never held Judah. The Babylonians took Judah, and they were not colonizers. Their attitude was, we're going to wipe out your town, burn it to the ground, and take all of you back to Babylon. You ought to live in our town. The archaeology verifies that the story of Assyria and northern Israel and Babylon and southern Judah is exactly true, just the way the Bible says. But you know the story of Jonah. He didn't want to go to Nineveh. He didn't want him to repent. He runs down to Joppa on the Mediterranean Sea coast, and he goes west instead of east. Uh, he's going to take a cruise, but uh, a storm comes up. Uh, they end up throwing him out of the boat, and the Bible says at the end of the first chapter, now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. We don't know what it was. We don't know if it was a great white shark. Uh, we don't know if it was a whale. We don't know if it was something just totally unique uh, that God had made for the occasion, but somehow he survived in it. In an air hatch in the head of the fish, uh, he survives for three days and three nights, and Jesus quotes this story. I think Jesus, being the Son of God, deliberately quoted everything controversial in the Old Testament. He knew they'd criticize Isaiah, so he quoted Isaiah. Uh, he knew they'd criticize Daniel, so he quotes Daniel. He knew they'd criticize Jonah, so he quotes Jonah uh, and says the sign of Jonah, three days and three nights in the belly of the fish, so will the Son of Man be, three days and three nights in the earth, etc., and finally, Jonah prayed to God in the second chapter, and you have his prayer as he pours out his heart, I'm sorry, you should have done this. And finally, the fish spit him up on the shore, and Jonah decided, I better get to Nineveh. Chapter 3, verse 2, the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, uh, saying to him, Arise, go to Nineveh, circle Nineveh's name. And he went to Nineveh and he proclaimed, Forty days from now the great city will fall under the judgment of God unless you repent. And the Bible says, they repented. The king put on sackcloth and ashes and said he was sorry for his sins. Now, I don't think they became Jews. I don't think they became Orthodox practicing Jews. But they repented. They were sorry for their sins. They called out unto God uh, on the scene, on the great sea. Jonah flees. But in the great city, Nineveh, Jonah preaches. And the people repented. And they put their faith in God. Notice the series of parallels and contrasts in the story. God commissions Jonah. Jonah flees. Jonah ends up in the fish. Jonah prays. God hears. God then sends him to preach. Jonah preaches. God spares. Jonah complains. God rebukes. Uh, the people turn to God. Uh, it says, who can tell that God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger and we will not perish? And God saw their works that they were turned from their evil way and he relented of the evil and did not send judgment upon them. It was a conditional prophecy conditioned upon whether or not they would repent. But then look at chapter 4 verse 1. But it displeased Jonah. It made Jonah mad. He didn't like it. Jonah was upset. Jonah is like, you got to be kidding. They repented. I knew it. And he was angry. And he prayed to the Lord. And he said, I, I wish I was dead. This is why I fled to Tarshish, to Europe, on that cruise. I, I knew you were a gracious God and merciful and slow to anger and full of kindness. Oh, take my life. I wish you were dead. I wish you'd have just killed those Assyrians. Fry those Iraqis. Oh, kill them all. That was Jonah's attitude. The book is a story about prejudice, not just fear. You see, in the first commission... Jonah was disobedient and fled. Then he repented and he went back to preach. 
But in the second commission, out of his repentance, he preached, but the people repented, and then Joseph, Jonah became disobedient, and Jonah complained about the whole thing. He got mad! And so he finally just went out and says in verse 5 of the fourth chapter, he sat down on the east side of the city. You never want to sit on the east side of a Middle Eastern city. That's where the desert sandstorms come from. And he sat down on the east side, and he made him a little booth, a little lean-to, and he sat there under the shadow of it to see what would happen. He became a watcher. I don't think they meant it. I don't think they really believed. I don't think they really repented. I'm going to watch them and see if they really got saved or not. And the God who prepared the fish that swallowed him prepared this weed, this gourd, this plant that grew up overnight. This large, big, leafy bush and the shadow of it came over his head to deliver him from his grief and from the sun. And he was glad because of the plant. And then God prepared a worm, a caterpillar, that came and ate the thing, ate the roots of it, and it shriveled up and it died. And then God prepared a vehement east wind and the sandstorm came and the sun beat upon his head and he really did wish that he would die. I can't believe it. I'm out here trying to preach the message and now look what's gone wrong. My gourd withered up and died. The God was trying to save him. My car broke down. My bus broke. I ran out of meetings. Nobody would listen to me anymore. What was the problem? In verse 9, God said to Jonah, You angry about the gourd? Yes, he said, I am. I'm angry enough. Angry to death. That's how angry I am. I am angry about the gourd. And God said, you didn't labor for the gourd. You didn't plant the little bush. Uh, you didn't send the shade. I, I, I sent all of that. And you've had pity on the bush. You feel sorry. Look at my poor little bush. It died. You feel bad about that, don't you, Jonah? Well, I want to tell you something, Jonah. I'm concerned about the people in Nineveh. Should I not spare Nineveh? You're concerned about a weed. I'm concerned about a town. I'm concerned about these people. Uh, there are 120,000 people who don't know their right hand from their left hand in the Assyrian Empire. And they're all going to fall under the judgment of God someday. Jonah, don't you understand? I have a heart for all people, for all nations, even for your enemy. No wonder Jesus would say in the New Testament, love your enemy. Do good unto him and show acts of kindness unto him. That is the display of the heart of God and of the heart of Jesus Christ himself. Jonah's experience teaches us something about the heart of God and convicts us of our own prejudice that sometimes we need to get out of our comfort zone. Sometimes we need to be willing to go to the places we don't want to go to that we're afraid to go to. Well, it's an Islamic nation. Well, maybe they need to hear your message. Well, all well, those people are racially different than me and ethnically different and they have a different culture and this is different and that is different. I don't know if they'd like me up there. Uh, yeah, yeah, whatever. And I'm just a southerner and I've got to go north, Ed. I'm a Yankee. I go down south. Come on. I'm from California. Hey, cool, man. Whatever. God wants to push you out of the box, out of the comfort zone, and send us to everybody with the message, Jesus loves you and can change your life. We come next to the prophet Micah, a contemporary of Isaiah, an 8th century prophet. Uh, notice how his prophecy begins. Chapter 1, verse 1, The word of the Lord came to Micah, uh, the Morishite, uh, in the days of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, same guys we read about in Isaiah. He saw concerning Samaria and Jerusalem. Underline Samaria and Jerusalem. He saw a vision of both kingdoms, north and south. He's writing to both Israel and to Judah, to both the northern and the southern tribes, with a message of a warning of judgment, but a promise of of hope. Hear all you people, he says, hearken, O earth, and all that is therein, and let the Lord God be witness against you, for the Lord is in his holy temple. Uh, he is concerned about you. Uh, he is calling unto you, Samaria. He is calling unto you, Jerusalem. Both of you will enter the judgment of God if you're not careful. Both of you will come under the hand of his wrath. Oh, don't declare it in Gath to the Philistines. Don't tell them. Uh, don't announce it to the heathen uh, that Samaria has fallen in the north, which was about to happen, that Jerusalem is going to fall in the south. Oh, no, here, you heads of Jacob, you princes of the house of Israel, don't you realize that judgment is coming? The Lord is coming. Uh, he is coming, and Jerusalem will end up in a pile of a heap at the end of chapter 3. Heaps upon heaps of judgment. 
But then he gives them a, a promise of a blessing that shall come as well, and he gives us his famous prediction of the birth of Christ at Bethlehem. Chapter 5, verse 2. But you, Bethlehem Ephratah, Bethlehem in the land of Judah, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you will come forth unto me he that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. The one who always has existed, the pre-existent God himself, shall come and be born incarnate as God on earth. Where? At Bethlehem. Circle Bethlehem in chapter 5, verse 2. Underline the words, ruler of Israel. When the wise men came to Jerusalem to Herod the king, saying, where is the baby that's been born, king of the Jews? Herod panics. So, well, the Messiah, has the Messiah been born? Get the scribes together. Where, 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 where do the prophets say the Messiah will be born? And their answer was what? In Bethlehem of Judah, Matthew 2, verse 6. They're quoting Micah 5, verse 2 that the prophet Micah said that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. Now that's unique because only David was born in Bethlehem. All the other kings from Solomon on were born in Jerusalem. And yet the prophet says the Messiah will be born in Bethlehem. He'll come out of the line and root of David himself. He is the one that shall come in the strength of the Lord and shepherd the flock and bless the people. He is the one that is the fulfillment of the promise. Oh, that the nations might see and be confounded in all of their might and that they might come and run to the Lord who can save them. If we outline the book of Micah, point number one, the judgment of the Lord. Hear all you people, chapters one and two. The hope of the Lord. Hear you heads of Jacob. And the pardon of the Lord here, O oh mountains, God is coming, blessing is coming, but trouble is coming. Who is like God that pardons iniquity, that passes by the transgression, that revives the remnant of his heritage because he delights in mercy? A God who is merciful enough to forgive repentant Assyrians is certainly merciful enough to forgive repentant Jews. And he calls on the northern kingdom, Samaria, and the southern kingdom of Jerusalem, repent and come to me. Well, there's time and hope because the Messiah is coming. He'll be born in Bethlehem. And his contemporary, Isaiah says, born of a virgin. And Matthew, Jesus' disciple, quotes both of them and says it's fulfilled in the life and the birth of Jesus Christ. We come next to the book of Nahum. Nahum is a book that deals ultimately with a series of prophecies that have to do with the coming of the judgment of God on Assyria. There are only two books in the Old Testament that end with a question. Jonah and Nahum, and they're both about Nineveh. Should I not have had mercy on these people, Jonah? Question mark. And, and then in the book of Nahum, it ends with a question mark. Uh, for upon who has this wickedness not passed on continually? Question mark. Uh, God raises the question and he lets the Assyrians answer it. Nahum's name, Nahum, means consolation. A prophet of Judah. Some think that perhaps the town of Capernaum, uh, Capernaum, may have had something to do with him, although that's in the north and he's in the south. But it's a similar name. He's preaching in the 600s BC. He's preaching uh, right at the time when the fall of Thebes in Egypt was passed and the fall of Nineveh in 612 B.C. was yet in the future. He comes to Judah, the southern kingdom, uh, to preach a message of vindicating God's judgment on Assyria. Uh, and he says the time of judgment is coming. Uh, notice how he begins chapter 1, verse 1, the burden of Nineveh of the book of the vision of Nahum, the Elkishite. God is jealous. The Lord revenges. The Lord revenges and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries. He is slow to anger. Yes, he is great in power, but he will not acquit the wicked. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. He knows those that trust in him, verse 7, but he brings judgment on those that reject him. Jonah, you didn't need to be all upset and worried about what God was going to do. God knew their hearts. God knew they were serious in the days of Jonah. 
but a generation later, they were not. They had turned away from God and forgotten God. God knew that. God knew they were going to come in and attack the northern kingdom. God was going to use them as a rod of anger to spank the northern kingdom and then turn around and break the rod and spank the Assyrians in turn. God would bring judgment upon them. Uh, and he saw this. Woe to the bloody city, he says in chapter 3. Uh, it, it is uh, full of lies and robbery. Its prey does not depart. The noise of the whip and the noise of the rattling of wheels and the prancing of horses and the jumping of chariots uh, and all the rest of it because of the multitude of their whoredoms uh, and their mistress of witchcrafts uh, and all of their evil. Nineveh is laid waste in verse 7. Underline that. Chapter 3, verse 7. Nineveh will eventually fall. Your shepherds will slumber, O king of Assyria. You'll forget God. You'll turn away from God. You'll again become a cruel nation and you'll come under the judgment of God. Nahum predicts that Assyria ultimately will fall. And in the development of the prophecy, in the last days of Ashurbanipal, 150 years after the time of Jonah, there will come an incredible cruelty by Assyrian leaders. The book can be outlined. The judgment of Nineveh is decreed in chapter 1. The judgment of Nineveh is described in chapter 2. And the judgment of Nineveh is defended in chapter 3. The theme, the judgment of Nineveh, the capital of Assyria, the city is destined to fall under the judgment of God. And then we go to Habakkuk and the focus of his prophecy is Babylon. If God can deal with Nineveh, God can deal with Babylon. If God can deal with the nation that tortured the northern kingdom, God can deal with the nation that tortured the southern kingdom as well. Notice how the next book begins, the book of Habakkuk. Uh, chapter 1, verse 1, The burden which Habakkuk the prophet did see. Underline that word burden. The Massah of the prophet. The Massah is a word loaded with emotion and pregnant with meaning. The idea that my heart is burdened and broken for what is going to happen. Isaiah the prophet uses it often. The doom and the burden of the prophet. Uh, the woe is the oive, but the burden is the Massah of the prophet. Oh, the Massah of Habakkuk, which he did see. O Lord, how long shall I cry and you will not hear? I cry even unto you out of violence, but you will not save. God, do something. Behold among the heathen, uh, in verse 5, uh, they, they do not regard, they do not wonder marvelously. I will do a work in your days in which you will not believe even though it was told you. For lo, I raised up the Chaldeans, the Babylonians, that bitter and hasty nation that shall march through the breadth of the land and possess the dwelling places thereof. They are terrible and dreadful. Their judgment and their dignity shall proceed themselves, but they will come under the judgment of God. Their horses are swifter than leopards. Uh, their attack on the city will bring the people of Israel to their knees. Verse 12, Art thou not from everlasting, O Lord my God, my Holy One? We will not die. O Lord, you have ordained them for judgment. O mighty God, you have established them for correction. We understand that, God. Won't you judge Babylon? Yes, I will, he said. The Lord answered me, chapter 2, verse 2, Write the vision and make it plain upon tables, so that he may run that reads it. Write the message clearly, Habakkuk. Write it out so it can be read. Write it on a table of stone that will not pass away, and let the messenger take it and run and read it. For the vision of the end is the appointed time, and the end of it shall speak and shall not lie, though it tarry. Wait for it, because surely it will come, and it will not tarry. Behold, the soul of him that is lifted up is not upright within him. The proud shall not be spared." but the just shall live by faith. That verse so important, Habakkuk 2.4, that it is quoted in the New Testament constantly in relation to the message of salvation that the just shall live by his faith. And then he calls out for revival, O Lord, in chapter 3. Here's the prayer of Habakkuk, the prophet. Upon Shiganoth, I'm singing my prayer to you, O Lord. I have heard your speech and I was afraid. O Lord, revive your work in the midst of the years, in the midst of the years, make known in wrath. Remember mercy. 
Oh God, I know we deserve your judgment. And the Babylonians are coming to judge the southern kingdom, the leaders of Judah. But God, in wrath, remember mercy. Remember that we are your people. And we are the only ones that are calling unto you. Judge us, yes. But judge Babylon as well. The book of Habakkuk, written by the prophet Habakkuk, a Judean prophet and priest, a prophet who comes on the scene right after Josiah's reforms in 622 B.C., but before Nebuchadnezzar's invasion in 605, writing to the leaders of Judah, trying to comfort Judah, condemn Babylon, but warning them, judgment is coming, and indeed it did. Nebuchadnezzar marched into town, conquered the city, and brought it down. Hope was fading. The end was coming. Babylon was rising to power. The theme of the book, the judgment of Babylon and the vindication of the sovereignty of God. We go to the next book and we go to the book of Zephaniah. Zephaniah was the great grandson of King Hezekiah, a royal prophet, a relative of King Josiah. He's living in 635 to 625, 20 years out from the Babylonian captivity. He's in Jerusalem. He's preaching to the people of Judah, and he's doing what? Calling them to revival. He's begging them, do something. Uh, Seek the Lord, chapter 2, verse 3. All ye meek of the earth, which have wrought his judgment, seek righteousness and meekness, that you may be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. God's judgment and wrath is coming upon this area. Repent. Uh, The great day of the Lord is near. Chapter 1, verse 14. Uh, And hastily, greatly, His voice is coming, calling out the day of the Lord, the day of wrath, the day of trouble, the day of distress, the day of thick darkness, the day when the high towers are destroyed and on fire. He's not talking about the World Trade Center. He's talking about the towers of Jerusalem. There is coming a time when Jerusalem will be burned and set to fire. I am begging you, while there is time, repent and turn to the Lord. An appeal for revival. And uh, while we know that is what we ought to do, while we know that that's what God calls all of us to do, uh, there is something about human nature that wants to say, yeah, yeah, God, I'll deal with that later. Not now. Don't bother me now. I'm going to live my life and... Later on, I'll repent. Later on, I'll get right with God. Zephaniah was reminding him, later on, you'll be out of time. Later on, you won't have this chance. Twenty years later, the Babylonians would march in and take the city, slay the king, and put their man on the throne. Better hurry up and do it now while there is time. The whole book, Uh, reminds us the day of God's wrath against Judah is coming, the day of God's judgment against the Gentiles is coming, and finally the day of God's deliverance is coming when He will turn back the captivity of His people. Sing, O daughter of Zion, He says in chapter 3, verse 14, Shout, O Israel, be glad and rejoice with all of your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away your judgments. He has cast out your enemy. The King of Israel, even the Lord, He's the King, is in the midst of thee. And you will not see evil anymore, no more worries and no more fears. When the King comes and He reigns and rules in Jerusalem, when the Messiah comes, there will be peace, because you'll have his kingdom on earth. And then we go to the book of Haggai. We go to the post-exilic prophets now, who prophesy after the Babylonian captivity. And these prophets remind us that even though the fulfillment of the prophecies and the warnings against Israel had come true, and the Assyrians attacked them and destroyed them, And the prophecies against Judah came too and the Babylonians crushed them and took them into captivity. God had not abandoned them and God was not through with them and God would give them one more chance to come back. And the three post-exilic prophets after the Babylonian captivity come on the scene. Haggai, in the second year of Darius the king, uh, Haggai the prophet said to Zerubbabel, uh, the governor of Judah, 
and Joshua the high priest. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, This is the people. Say to them, The time is not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. But tell them it is the time. This is the time. Rebuild the temple. Rise up before you rebuild the city, before you rebuild your houses. Build the temple of God the second time. And then Zerubbabel in verse 12, And Joshua the high priest and the remnant of the people obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet. Uh, And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel uh, and Joshua the high priest and the remnant of the people and they did the work on the house of God and they began to rebuild the house. And they're praying to the Lord that the glory of the latter house will be greater than that of the former house. But it wasn't. Uh, That this would be a temple that would honor the Lord, that we would do what was right. But it was never filled with His glory and with His power. A guy told him the right thing. If you're going to go back and rebuild the nation, you better start by rebuilding the house of God. Put first things first. Put your attention on the house of God. Who wrote the book? Haggai, a contemporary of Zechariah, the prophet, of Zerubbabel, the governor, in about 520 B.C., to the returned exiles in Jerusalem to encourage them to rebuild the temple. And indeed, they did. Uh, The prophet kept on preaching. He would not let up. uh, And the foundation of the temple was laid. Uh, And again, verse 20 says, The word of the Lord came unto Haggai the prophet in the 24th day of the month, uh, saying, Speak to Zerubbabel uh, and say to him, I will shake the heavens and the earth and overthrow the throne of the kingdoms and destroy the strength of the kingdoms. And Zerubbabel, my servant, shall be like a signet ring on my hand. Now bless him and bless his works, build the temple, finish the job, and they did. Then we come to the book of Zechariah, one of the most important of all the minor prophets. And in the book of Zechariah, Zechariah is the leader of the Levites between 520 and 500 B.C., also preaching to the returned exiles in Jerusalem. What is he saying? Prepare for the coming of of the Messiah. Notice chapter 1 verse 1, in the eighth month of the second year of Darius the king, the word of the Lord came to Zechariah, saying that he's displeased with your fathers, your forefathers, uh, that he wants you to repent and turn to him and let him bless you. Uh, The former prophets came before the captivity and they preached to you and you didn't listen to me. Now I'm sending you, Zechariah, you go and you preach to them. And Zechariah gives us these amazing prophecies in his book. Amazing prophecies of the coming of Christ, the coming of the Messiah himself. We can divide the prophecies into eight visions that are given in the first six chapters, four messages in chapters 7 and 8, two burdens of the prophet that are delivered in chapters 9 to 14, And we can outline the book between Zion's sanctuary, the temple, chapters 1 to 6, Zion's services, their worship to the Lord, in chapters 7 and 8, and Zion's Savior in chapters 9 to 14, who is both rejected and yet reigning. Zechariah opens the prophecy in chapter 1 and says, I see colored horses riding across the horizon. Uh, I see them down there among the myrtle trees. Uh, They're red and white and black and speckled, etc. Four colored horses, similar to the four horsemen of the apocalypse of the book of Revelation that symbolize the coming of the judgment of God and the angel of the Lord is moving among them. The angel of the Lord is coming. I am jealous for Jerusalem and for Zion, he says, uh, and yet I am upset with my people who have turned against me and upset with the Gentiles that have attacked them and I have come to cast out the horns of the Gentiles who have dared to lift up their hand against Judah in the last days. Uh, And then he tells him to go with a measuring line and measure the city of Jerusalem. Uh, Go and measure the temple uh, because the city of Jerusalem is the apple of his eye. Uh, And then he talks about blessing Joshua the high priest. Uh, But I see Satan standing at the right hand to resist him. Satan coming to accuse the brethren, to attack the believers. Uh, But I also see someone coming in the distance. Uh, I see in chapter 3 verse 8 the branch 
The servant of the Lord is coming. The branch of the Lord. I see the coming of Zerubbabel to lay the foundations of the house of the temple. I'll defend the governor Zerubbabel. I'll bless the high priest Joshua. But ultimately they need somebody better than that. They need a king. That's who they need. They need the branch that rises out of Jacob's kingdom out of David's throne, the branch of the kingdom of David. He is the one that shall come. Uh, In chapter 6, he sees again in verse 12, the branch uh, shall grow up before him and the Lord shall use him to build the temple and bless his life, etc. The king is coming. Uh, in chapter 9, verse 9. Uh, o daughter of Jerusalem, shout, uh, thy king is coming, uh, having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, on the colt of a donkey. He foresees the coming of the Messiah, who rides humbly into Jerusalem, not on a horse, who comes riding on a donkey. The people are shouting Hosanna, he says. They're waving the palm branches. He foresees Palm Sunday. The Savior is coming. But then he says he's rejected. In chapter 11, verse 12, uh, If you think it good, give me my price. If not, forbear. So they weighed for my price 30 pieces of silver. And the Lord said to me, cast it to the potter, a goodly price that I was priced of them, 30 lousy pieces of silver, the price of a common slave. And I took the 30 pieces of silver and cast them to the potter uh, in, in the house of the Lord. Jesus betrayed for 30 pieces of silver by his own disciple, Judas. And Judas in remorse says, I can't keep the money. And he goes back to the priest and says, take the money back. And they say, no, we can't take the money. And he throws the money on the floor of the temple and he runs out and they took the 30 pieces of silver and gave them to the potter, the guy that made pottery over in the corner. Uh, Buy the potter's field. Buy a little piece of ground out there to throw the junk pottery on. The broken pottery that represents our broken lives that Jesus went to Calvary to die for, that he might redeem us and that the potter might reshape us and remake us into his people. And then Zechariah goes on in the 12th chapter, And he gets even more specific. He says in verse 10, I will pour out upon the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace, the spirit of supplications. They will look on me whom they have pierced, nailed through, and they will mourn for him as you mourn for an only son. And in that day there will be great mourning in Jerusalem as the mourning of Hadad Rimon in the valley of Megiddo at Armageddon when the army is coming of the Antichrist. To attack Jerusalem, they'll turn to me and cry out to me and realize that I am their Savior. I am the son of Abraham. I am the son of David. I am the Son of God. And in that day, chapter 13, verse 1 says, a fountain will be opened in the house of Jerusalem uh, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem in the house of David, a fountain of cleansing for sin to cleanse them from their sin. And in that day, someone will say to me in verse 6, what are these wounds in your hands? And I said, I have received these in the house of my friends. Everybody argues over who crucified Jesus. The Jews said, crucify him. Yeah, but the Romans did it. And our sins killed him and nailed him to the cross. It's our fault that he dies. Oh, he said, they've smitten the shepherd and scattered the sheep. But I have not abandoned them. For the day of the Lord will come when I'll gather all the nations to Jerusalem to battle in 14.2. And I will bring judgment upon them And his feet, in verse 4, will stand in that day on the Mount of Olives and the mountain will split in half and Christ will return in his second coming. And when the Mount of Olives splits, when the king comes back and the judgment of God falls, Jesus Christ will come and gather his people unto salvation and the plagues will cease and the judgments will be fulfilled and the act of the wrath of God will be complete and Jerusalem will once again be holiness unto the Lord at the end of the chapter. That they'll even write it on the bells of the horses and on the pans and the dishes in the kitchen that the city has finally become the holy city that God intended for her to be. When we look at all the prophecies of the coming of Christ in Zechariah, he's the branch He's the king priest, the lowly king, riding on the donkey. 
betrayed for 30 pieces of silver, crucified and nailed to the cross, the smitten shepherd, the triumphal king, who in his second coming returns in power and majesty, King of kings, Lord of lords. That is the day when Jesus Christ shall come again. And then we come to the last book of the Old Testament, to the book of Malachi, the final book where the emphasis is on preparing again for the coming of the Savior. The name Malachi means messenger. And notice how he begins, the burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi, a post-exilic prophet, the last of the prophets, I have loved you, says the Lord. Wherein have I loved you? Uh, I loved you because I loved Jacob. I I magnified Israel and his border. I honored you and loved you and let you have forgotten me and walked away from me. Malachi is preaching in the 400s B.C the last prophet of the Old Testament, right before the intertestamental period, right before the 400 silent years, to the Jews in Judah to warn this backslidden remnant, if you don't straighten up, it'll be too late for you. Uh, he, He warns them that they have robbed God, and they said, where have we robbed God? You have robbed Him of tithes and offerings in chapter 3. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, and I will rebuke the devourer. Give unto me, and be unto me the kind of people that you ought to be. I'm going to send you a messenger, chapter 3, verse 1. Behold, I send my messenger. He will prepare the way before me. uh, And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant. And who shall abide the day of his coming? Uh, I'm going to send John the Baptist, the messenger of the Lord, before the Lord to say, prepare the way of the Lord. The voice in the wilderness shouting, behold your God. Malachi is saying the same thing Isaiah said, uh, and yet he warns them that if you do not repent, you will not receive the Son of Righteousness in chapter 4. The day is coming that shall burn like an oven, uh, that shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts. He'll burn up the root and the branches uh, of the rubble. Uh, But those that fear the name of the Lord shall be the son of righteousness who shall rise with healing in his wings. Uh, The son of God is coming, but the judgment of God is coming. Remember the law of Moses. Uh, Behold, chapter 4, verse 5, I send you Elijah the prophet, circle Elijah's name, before the coming great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to the fathers, or else I will come and smite the land with a curse. And the Old Testament ends with a dull thud, the curse of the law. If you don't repent, if you repent and you heed the message, the messenger will come and say, prepare the way of the Lord, John the Baptist, be baptized and repent, Uh, prepare for the coming of the Messiah, the king will come, Jesus will come, and you'll receive the king and you'll get the blessings of the kingdom. But if you don't, you'll come under the curse of the law and you'll lose that wonderful opportunity to receive the blessings of the king. The Old Testament, the Bible says, is our schoolmaster to do what? Bring us to Christ. It points to Jesus like a steeple on a church points to heaven, that Christ is coming. He is the Savior. He is the answer. That there is, apart from Him, no message of salvation, no permanent opportunity at all. And in the promise that Elijah would come, Jesus will say later in the New Testament that this is fulfilled in John the Baptist. That I tell you, Elijah has already come. The disciples said, what about the coming of Elijah? They're quoting Malachi 4. I tell you, he's already come. That rough-hewn prophet of God out in the wilderness Just like Elijah, John the Baptist has come. He has brought the message of preparation. The king is coming because John the Baptist is coming to announce the arrival of the king. Repent and open your heart to him. The Old Testament leaves us waiting for the coming of the Messiah, the coming of the Savior the coming of the kingdom. Uh, The Old Testament is incomplete without the new. The Old Testament prophesies a, a Savior is coming, a Messiah is coming, a King is coming, God is coming. But it never happens until Jesus comes on the scene and fulfills the final promises. If we look back over the entire story of the Old Testament, it takes us from creation to the curse. In the beginning, God created. It begins so well. 
that ends so poorly, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. In the New Testament, it begins with Christ. This is the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of Abraham, the son of David, the fulfillment of all the promises. And it ends with the promise of grace. Behold, I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus, and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. It's often been said that the story of the Bible begins in a garden, the Garden of Eden. It ends in a city, in the eternal city, the New Jerusalem. And in between stands the cross of Jesus Christ that determines the course of history and the destiny of your own personal life. The Old Testament tells us in the law, a prophet is coming, a star will rise out of Jacob, the Passover lamb, the atoning sacrifice will finally be fulfilled. Uh, the books of history tell us uh, that the anointed one is coming, the Mashiach of God, the king of Israel is coming, the protector of the Jews is coming, the defender of Israel, the winner of the battle of Armageddon is coming, uh, the prophets tell us uh, that the Messiah is coming, the poets tell us uh, that the song of God and the wisdom of God is fulfilled in him, that if you see Jesus Christ, you see God on display in human flesh. If you want to know what God is like, look into the eyes of Christ and see what He is like. A Savior that loves you, that went to the cross to die for your sins. He is worthy of your worship, worthy of your devotion, worthy of your faith, worthy of your life. He goes to the cross to say, I'll take the curse. I'll die in your place. Pour the curse of the law on me so that all that believe in me and trust in me and look to me for salvation, you ends of the earth, and you shall be saved. For the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Then we receive from Him the gift of salvation that we do not deserve, that we cannot earn. It is all by the grace of God. Hallelujah. What a Savior. What a promise. Jesus has come. And he's coming again. The question is, again, is he coming for you? God bless you.